Hello and welcome to my channel IELTS Listening. Let's start with one of the best practice tests for improving listening skills. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You'll hear a mother, Shirley, talking to Kate, an admissions officer at a school. First, you'll have some time to look at questions one to three. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Good morning. You must be Shirley Peters. My name's Kate. Yes, hello. I'm Shirley Peters. Nice to meet you. You have a 10 o'clock appointment with us. That's right. I'm supposed to go to the admissions office. Is that here? Yes, it is. Please take a seat as I have several forms for you to fill in to enable you to enrol your son at this school. We have a form for your name, address and so on, one for the health of your son and one for him to choose extra subjects to join him. Thank you. Now, firstly, this form is just so we have a record of your son's personal details. Can you fill it in for me? Yes, I'll do that now. Can I just check the details with you? Your son's first name is John. No, that's his middle name after his father, Richard John. My son's name is Colwyn. Can you please spell it C-O-L-W-I-N, not C-O-L-W-Y-N, as some people do? Yes, I'll make a note of that. And how old is Colwyn? I've put down that he's entering year six, so therefore he's 11 years old, turning 12 this year. So at the moment, he's 11? Yes, correct. You now have some time to look at questions four to ten. Now answer questions 4 to 10. Let's move on to your address. Do you live at 7 Watley Crescent, Mount Lawley? Yes, that's right. The street is spelt W-H-A-T-L-E-Y Crescent in Mount Lawley. Yes, I can see you've written that. Which phone number is best to contact you on? Well, I'm out and about doing things during the day, so probably my mobile rather than the home number. So that's 041 Yes, 041 Secondly, can you complete this form regarding your son's health? Yes, I'll do it for you now. Thank you. Now, can I go through the more important areas of this form with you to make sure our information is accurate? Yes, of course. Is your son taking any medication at the moment that the teachers will need to be aware of? Yes, he has asthma, so he will be carrying his puffer in his school bag. So he has a puffer. Is he allergic to anything? Yes, peanuts. Actually, he should avoid all types of nuts. That's OK, because we have a policy of not having any nuts in our school. Is there anything else that you think we should be aware of? As I've written down, he also wears glasses, which he needs to keep on all the time. I'll highlight that section on the form so his teacher will know about his glasses. Finally, this school has a wide range of interesting subjects that your son can participate in. Could you mark on this form what your son would like to do? Yes, certainly. Here you are. Firstly, it seems your son is particularly interested in football, so I'll make a note of that. Secondly, with regard to music, would you like him to start learning the piano in music class? Yes, that would be fantastic. Now, turning to art, I'll let his art teacher know that he likes drawing cartoons. Wonderful. Finally, let's look at languages now. Did you know that Mandarin was actually only started at the school this year? Really? 
Well, I think Chinese would be the most useful, even though my son's friends have already been learning Indonesian and Italian. Well, now we have all the information we require about your son. We hope he enjoys himself at our school. I'm sure he will. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a TV program on an organization of environment protection. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Today in our studio is Sue Gent, a staff member of Clean Up Australia. Thank you, Tony. As we know, the mission of Clean Up Australia is to inspire and work with communities to clean up, fix up and conserve our environment. Now, we are launching Say No to Plastic Bags campaign. The focus is to enable shoppers and retailers to reduce the number of plastic bags handed out at checkouts. How much do you know about plastic bags? Plastic is a recyclable resource. They are manufactured from non-renewable resources like oil and gas. The embodied petroleum energy contained in 8.7 checkout bags is enough to drive a car one kilometre. If plastic is not recycled, this embodied energy is lost from the resource chain. An estimated 36,700 tonnes of plastic bags are disposed of in landfill sites throughout Australia each year. Australians dump 4,000 recyclable plastic bags into landfills every minute. How does plastic litter harm the environment? Many thousands of seabirds and marine mammals die every year around the world as a result of plastic litter. When the animal dies and decays, the plastic is free again to repeat the deadly cycle. There are two reasons that plastic bags are particularly problematic in the litter stream. Firstly, they last from 20 to a thousand years. Secondly, they escape and float easily in air and water, traveling long distances. Now, any questions from you? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. How can I help reduce the number of plastic bags used? In addition to saying no to plastic bags at supermarkets, you can help reduce plastic bags at convenience stores and takeaway food shops. These retailers account for 47% of single-use plastic shopping bags. You can help in the following ways. For example, you can keep a reusable bag in your car or handbag to use for unexpected purchases. Besides, if you have placed a big order at a takeaway store, ask for the food to be packed in a cardboard box that can later be recycled. 
Could you tell me where I can recycle my plastic bags? Well, most larger supermarkets and local stockland shopping centers have recycling facilities available. Remember to turn bags inside out and remove any receipts and food scraps before recycling. Contamination can cause problems in production and prevent recycled plastic from being used. What happens to recycled plastic bags? Plastic bags are recycled to make garden furniture, garden sleepers, flower pots, and new plastic bags. Should I use biodegradable plastic bags? A biodegradable product is one that breaks down safely by biological means into the raw materials of nature and disappears into the environment. There is currently no Australian standard for biodegradable plastic bags. This means there is no guarantee that bags will completely break down, as claimed by their manufacturer. Until an Australian standard has been developed and these bags have been tested, Clean Up Australia cannot recommend using plastic bags that claim to be biodegradable. Overall, do our best to refuse, reduce, and reuse plastic bags whenever possible. If you throw plastic bags away, tie them in a knot. This limits the chance that they'll blow out of a bin or blow away in landfills. By following a few simple steps, we can stop plastic bags from blocking our drains and creeks, injuring our precious marine life, and harming our wildlife. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk given by Kate Tomlin on the history of technology. First, look at questions twenty-one to twenty-three. As you listen, answer the questions. Our talk today in this History of Technology series is about a feat of anti-engineering from the late 19th and early 20th century that is still very much with us today, and that is linked with the history of the typewriter. It's the QWERTY keyboard. What you might ask is QWERTY. Well. Have a look at the nearest typewriter or computer keyboard. If you look at the top row, you will see that Q, W, E, R, T, Y are the first six letters. Did you ever think when you were learning to type about why the letters on the keyboard are distributed the way they are? Here's the story. It all has to do with the history of the typewriter. Typewriters existed since the early 1700s, but the first commercially practical system came into being in 1873. The typewriter is one of America's greatest unsung inventions. While the telephone, automobile, and airplane sped up communications and transportation, the typewriter did the same thing for the written word. But few people paid much attention possibly because they were too busy reading what the typewriter had written about all the other inventions. The first typewriters had the keys laid out in alphabetical order, but this system had problems. Some keys that tended to be typed together were physically close. This made the type bars hit each other and get stuck. Typewriters in 1873 jammed or got stuck if the keys next to each other were hit in quick succession. To solve this problem, in 1878, the QWERTY keyboard was developed, spacing frequent letters away from each other and therefore reducing the number of jams.
It was not specifically designed to slow down typists, as is generally believed, but the keyboard did create a built-in inefficiency for typists. The most common keys are scattered all over the keyboard rows, many on the left side. Right-handed people have to use their left hand, which is the weaker hand. Typewriter technology improved, doing away with the original rationale for the QWERTY distribution. But the keyboard remained. In spite of its inefficiency, it is the keyboard we all use today. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. Already back in 1932, there was a solution to the problem. Efficiency expert August Dvorak came up with a new keyboard layout. His home row consisted of A, O, E, U, I, D, H, T, N, S, which includes all of the vowels as well as the most commonly used letters. On this keyboard, over 3,000 words can be typed using only the home row. In fact, 70% of all the work can be done on the home row, 22% on the row above, and 8% on the row below. The QWERTY keyboard allows only about 50 words to be typed without reaching for other rows. In addition, on Dvorak's keyboard, the right hand handles 56% of the workload and the left handles 44%, just about the opposite of the division of the QWERTY keyboard. This is an advantage for most right-handers. The Dvorak keyboard increased accuracy in typing by almost 50% and speed by 15 to 20%. How much labor did this Dvorak layout save? In one study, a group of typists was evaluated in the use of both keyboards. Those using the Dvorak keyboard moved their fingers just about one mile on an average day, while those who used the QWERTY keyboard moved their fingers an average of 12 to 20 miles. The superiority of the Dvorak keyboard was clearly established. However, it has never been adopted as the keyboard of choice. Why? First of all, bad luck and bad timing on the part of the Dvorak team. First, there was a depression. Not a good time for introducing change. But the main factor that worked against the Dvorak system was habit. People were used to the QWERTY keyboard. Computers today could easily switch the arrangement of letters to the Dvorak layout, but it seemed that because of habit, the QWERTY layout remains dominant. People felt comfortable with the keyboard they learned on, so it was the established patterns of hundreds of millions of typists, manufacturers, typing teachers, and typewriter salespeople that have crushed all moves toward keyboard efficiency for over 70 years. It looks like QWERTY Keyboard may be with us for a long time yet. That is the end of Part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The word thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's thesaurus is linguist Dr. Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language. Well, the 150th edition has just come out. It sold 32 million copies. Yes, that's right, 32 million. What is it? Roger's thesaurus. Now, Roger's thesaurus is a type of dictionary in which words with similar meanings are grouped together. The word thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's thesaurus is linguist Dr. Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language, but what do we know about the man himself? Well, Mr. Roger, or to give him his full name, Peter Mark Roger, was a very interesting man indeed. He grew up in London, he was French, and he spent his early life in a French community there. He later travelled all the way from London to Edinburgh to study medicine at the university there and graduated when he was 19 years old. And he later went on to become a founder of Manchester Medical School. So his life focused around his career as a doctor? Well, actually, no. Roger had a very wide range of interests indeed. In fact, he was a writer and wrote about many topics such as bees, the kaleidoscope, and even perception and feeling in animals. And he was an inventor too. In fact, in 1814, he invented an early version of the slide rule. The slide rule? Yes, the device that can calculate numbers. Then ten years later, he developed a prototype for the cine camera. And he also got involved in a range of different projects. For example, he became head of a commission investigating London's water supply and he developed a method of water filtration through sand. And he was involved in the area of education. He was one of the founders of London University. And do you play chess by any chance, Mark? Yes, I do. Well, Roger invented the travelling chess set. So next time you're playing a game of chess on a train, you have Mr Roger to thank. So... How did he actually find the time to classify the English language? Well, he only turned his full attention to the thesaurus when he retired, and that was when he was in his 70s. So what inspired him to write the thesaurus? Well, Roger believed that he should bring as much happiness and knowledge to the greatest number of people. So, during his career as a doctor, he gave free treatment to patients who couldn't afford to pay. We also know that he set up a clinic to help poor people to recover from operations and serious illnesses. Basically, he wrote the thesaurus to help people learn. He aimed to help those who needed practice in writing. He believed that writing skills would help people become more independent and lead happier lives. How popular is the thesaurus today? Well, it was first published in 1852 and it has never been out of print since. In fact, the book has become more popular with each edition that comes out. The invention of the crossword puzzle in 1913 certainly helped to increase the sales figures, though. I think the main reason why it is so popular is that it's thematic. So you can come across words that you've never even thought of when you began looking for the word in the first place. Thanks, Cindy. Now join us again after this short break, when I'll be talking to Derek Spode, chairperson of East Anglia News. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Dear viewers, thank you for taking this listening test. Please let me know about your score in the comments section below. Keep on practicing. It's the only way to be successful. We are planning to upload more IELTS helpful videos. Please subscribe to our channel, IELTS Listening.
Thank you.